Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for joining us today for this roundtable discussion on the importance of song in today's world. My name is Javier Arrebola, and I'm a pianist. I'm a member of the Songfest faculty and of the team curating and producing these series of events for Songfest. And I'm also a proud alumnus of the program. It is an absolute pleasure and a profound privilege to welcome today's panelists, an extraordinary group of living legends in the field of music and in the arts. Joining us today are Maestro James Conlon, currently music director of Los Angeles Opera. Maestro Conlon is one of today's most versatile and respected conductors. He has cultivated a vast symphonic, operatic and choral repertoire and has conducted virtually every major American and European symphony orchestra since his debut with the New York Philharmonic. Through worldwide touring and extensive discography and videography, numerous essays and commentaries, frequent television appearances and guest speaking engagements, Maestro Conlon is one of classical music's most recognized interpreters. We're very honored to have you with us today. Thank you. Pianist Margot Garrett has enjoyed a long international career as a pedagogue and as a performing artist. Among many other positions, Ms. Garrett has served as head of the collaborative piano departments of the New England Conservatory in Boston and of the Juilliard School in New York City. And also as head of the vocal programs at the Tanglewood Music Center and at Ravinia's Staines Music Institute for many years. It is a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you. Composer Jake Heggie, one of the most beloved composers of today. Mr. Heggie is the composer of several one acts and of eight full length operas, including titles such as Dead Man Walking, Moby Dick, It's a Wonderful Life and Three Decembers. In addition to his works for the stage, Mr. Heggie has composed nearly 300 art songs as well as concerti, chamber music, choral and orchestral works. Thank you very much for joining this panel today. I know it, it's early in the morning in California. <laughs> I'm grateful to be with you all. Then same goes for uh, Maestro Conlon. Thank you for joining us early in the morning. And uh, pianist and scholar Graham Johnson, one of the world's leading vocal accompanists. Mr. Johnson has performed with the world's leading recitalists and has recorded extensively for Hyperion Records. He is currently senior professor of accompaniment at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. He was made an OBE in 1994, created Chevalier in the Ordre des Arts et Lettres by the French government in 2002, and made an honorary member of the Royal Philharmonic Society in 2010. Mr. Johnson has been awarded the Wigmore Hall Medal and has received honorary doctorates from Durham University, Boston's New England Conservatory and Perth in Western Australia. In 2014, he was awarded the Hugo Wolf Medal for his services to the art of song. Mr. Johnson is also the author of a three volume encyclopedia on the songs of Franz Schubert, as well as of seminal studies of the songs of Benjamin Britten, Gabriel Faure, Robert Schumann, and Francis Poulenc, among others. It is an honor to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I would just like to start off by asking this wonderful panel what may be the most important question that brings us all here today, which is um, why song? <laughs> why song at all? Is there anything in this seemingly modest combination of words and music that is important to preserve and disseminate in today's ever-changing world? Um, how can songs serve today's audiences? We can start whenever 
Wonderful. Well, all I can tell you is um, song has saved my life over and over again since I was a child. And uh, I know it's the same for a lot of people. Um, whether it's a very simple song, whether it's a very complex intellectual endeavor, um, it engages our brains and our hearts in a very natural, primal way. I think the, the, the individual voice, the solo voice um, and rhythm and that combination um, is, the, those, that's pretty much the first thing we all know. Um, and so it brings us peace, it brings us comfort, it, it centers us, it connects us. Um, it gives us perspective. Um, and like I said, for me over and over, whether it's um, classical art song or popular song or jazz throughout my life, uh, song has not only um, centered and saved me, um, but opened up new doors and horizons for me that I could not have imagined. And I think that's why it is essential um, to most people, whether they know it or not. Thank you. Well, I'll chime in. Uh, I see no essential difference between uh, song and any other uh, any other genre in classical music. Uh, and I I ask myself the question: Why does anyone question its necessity and its validity? I've uh, lived long enough to see a uh, a decrease in interest in uh, leader recitals, song recitals in general. I, mean, I remember, you know, having grown up in New York, of going to Carnegie Hall when uh, Fisher Discal came to New York and could sell out ha Carnegie Hall three times in three weeks. Uh, and barely anybody today uh, can sell out a song recital. So that's not a measure of the uh, of the art form. That is a commentary and a challenge and a question to the rest of us: is how has that happened, and what can we do to turn that around? Because as uh, uh, as Mr. Johnson can tell us all uh, better than anybody else, the uh, the density and the richness of the song repertoire, particularly German leader, which is which is where that's my penchant, but that's uh, that's personal. Uh, this is not. This is not to be ignored. Cannot be ignored. And I think we all have to ask ourselves what we can do uh, to change and influence the tastes of uh, young people, musicians, non-musicians, to uh, to bring them back into that world, which I think is very important. Thank you. I may because I'd like to leave the last word to Graham. Um, I think song uh, has saved me uh, from the beginning. I grew up in a Protestant family um, who went to church and sang those hymns, and words became very important to me um, and their meaning. So song, art song, spiritual, um, our um, penchant for um, the musical, um, as opposed to the opera, all of that is incredibly important and has been a way for me to touch my own emotions and to be in contact with myself when otherwise I might not have had the ability because song internalizes. Um, I feel that, uh, to be an artist of the song, a servant of the song as a pianist or as a singer is to go deeper into yourself, to discover things about yourself. And if you are successful enough, an audience cannot help but be drawn to you, but in a way that puts them more in touch with themselves they who don't have the ability to do what we do on the stage. And I don't think my life would have had nearly so much meaning if I had not understood that, uh, starting from um, the church and then very far away from the church, uh, but in, co in the concert halls. And also in these days, I find myself coming 
to the computer to listen to song and to uh, see song uh, performed as much as I can because it helps me get in touch with a part of myself that otherwise I find too painful these days. So it, get, it makes me quiet of spirit and it opens me up in a way that I don't think I could do right now otherwise. So I'm particularly grateful. Thank you. What a marvelous um, assembly of reactions and thoughts. Every single one absolutely valid. I would comment on, comment on um, Maestro Conlon's vision of full leader Arbinder in New York with Fischer Disco mm -hmm. to say everything has a historical cycle. At that point in our young years when Fischer Disco came to New York or London, the audiences, many of them older people, were for sad and tragic historical reasons, German speaking. And the emigre Jewish population in New York were at the very center of those full houses with their longing for a homeland that had been snatched from them. And their extraordinary ability to sit there and Fischer Diskar told me that himself saying the words as he said them because they knew all the songs by heart. Of course, this population gradually died away in the 60s and 70s and has now almost entirely died away. Around the corner from me, Anita Walfisch Lasker, a survivor from Auschwitz and a famous one and a wonderful cellist is 96. So that generation has gone. But look at all the teachers who came to teach song as a result of that emigration from Austria and Germany. The people who came to this country to play string quartets like the Amadeus and the singing teacher. I mean, that was a huge historical convulsion that actually made song in the 1940s and Fischer Diskar in particular, a new emissary with, George, with Gerald Moore by his side for a new type of peaceful collaboration of the arts, a, a consecration of, of a new world that was beginning after the Second World War. So in the, in the absence of such huge events, such movements of people who took German leader Arbinder in their stride, indeed they longed to hear German sung by a master. We have different problems. And for me, one of the great problems is, as Jake absolutely knows as a composer of operas and concerti and many other things, that the music that we perform and actually the song that we are talking about in this forum is the result of great musicians writing who can write a lot of other material. They've written operas and they've written concertos and sonatas and Schubert was a great song composer in my opinion because he was capable of writing a lot of other great things in other media. And we hear that in the songs. We hear his symphonic mastery in the songs. We hear his mastery of the string quartets in the songs and in his piano writing we recognize a person capable of writing great piano sonatas. We have got that enormous luxury of enjoying a wide spectrum of song. There's the song that we do and we pay service as Margot has to hymns and to spirituals and to popular music and to musicals, the genius of Gershwin and, and, and Richard Rogers. And we, we pay tribute to Beyonce and we trade, pay tribute to the people who are able to fill arenas of people with song, with lyrics and words and melody. But the point is that in this world of populism, we are in our little corner, the song that matters to us professionally as performers, we are on the defensive. Because the word song has naturally gone to mean something else. A violent sonata doesn't mean anything very special to uh, a whole group of people in an arena. A violinist is not normally fighting for fame um, with another type of violinist. I mean, great jazz violinists. Yes, there have been great jazz violinists. But a singer is essentially at the moment extremely vulnerable because the people who are also singing in other spheres are much more famous 
make a lot more money and seem to set the standard for what is acceptable, which is to say immediately arresting, foot tappable, memorable, and all those wonderful, lovely things that popular music can be when it's at its best. What we are left with is taking the example of a Schubert song, something entirely different, entirely more internal, more complicated, more highly machined, in a sense, older, with a restriction of language, which makes a further difficulty, with an element of a single piano, which is both its glory and its uh, disadvantage in terms of catching people's attention. And the requirement of concentration, of figuring out the wonders of how a musical idea comes out of a verbal idea, one of the great miracles of the great song composers of Lido. This extraordinary thing, which is so valuable to us, appears irrelevant, boring, not terribly arresting. And we are tolerant and we love our Richard Rogers. I bet many of us can sing all the sound of music by heart. I know I can. But what about when things move the other way? That's, that's the enormous problem because voice and piano, even Elton John does voice and piano. Ronaldo Hahn accompanied himself, Roger Coulter accompanied himself, and so did Karl Lerva all throughout his career. But Elton accompanies himself and makes millions and has wonderful followers. I don't decry his work and I'm not a snob about it. It's a social and incredible phenomenon. But then what are we going to do to try and make song palatable when we have such overwhelming competition? from people doing the same thing, using their voice, using melody, using lyrics, using words. What are we to do? And uh, yeah, I have my thoughts on that, maybe some surprising ones, but I mean, that's how song seems to me. As Javier said, why song? Javier, nobody says that because everybody's got a song on their computer as we speak, it's not, the sort of song where we are performing, sadly, or at least not very often. <laughs> but everybody's got a song. People don't need to be persuaded that a sound of a voice with the lyric is moving because it's a lingua franca. It's everywhere. What we're talking about is the type of song that is older, more complicated, with a linguistic barrier, and with reserves of concentration, history, cultural background, historical background, sociological context, that is simply not of interest to most people. We have a major problem. So I think um, you could ask why a violin sonata, because there may be many people for whom a violin sonata means nothing at all. And then one could make an eloquent case for the greatness of the great violence and artists, but song, song has got competition, really mean competition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our you type of song that. is good. <laughs> and sorry, that's, that's, uh, that's the situation as I see it anyway. You make, you make so many great points. That's a, it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, statement, Graham, and so true. And and uh, the thing is, it doesn't belittle or take away the importance or significance of art song at all. It just means we're in a very different phase culturally. People are very visual. People are not as inclined to go to quiet places of reflection. They want the activity, the interaction, the communication in a very different way. And, uh, and which is why audiences have veered away. Um, we did not do a very good job in the concert and classical world of welcoming, welcoming new people in. Um, we, we, we got a little snobby about it um, a, a while ago, and I think it scared a lot of people away. Um, and uh, because people don't want to feel that they are, they are stupid or that they don't know enough or that they're not smart enough. You know, I don't want to feel that way when I go to hear a concert. I want to feel welcomed in and excited about being there. And I think this opening up of the, of the, of the 
of the concert door to welcome many, many different kinds of people and many different backgrounds and uh, into, into the, the, to the fray is, is key to the success and survival. And there are great concert artists now who are working on that. We have Joyce DiDonato, we have uh, Jamie Barton, we have great singers of song and opera who are well aware of how to work with social media and bring people in and get people excited and actually expand. Um, my goal is not only to embrace and celebrate all of that and help people understand how they can reach out and bring song to a wider community and uh, keep it alive and relevant the same way we want to keep it alive, but, um, but also to, um, to, to inspire uh, po the popular artists that you're talking about to embrace it. I remember a big moment for me when I was a kid was when the classical Barbara album came out. I don't know if you remember that, when Barbara Streisand sang a bunch of classical uh, songs. And um, it, was, it was a light bulb moment for me because I grew up in a household where there wasn't any art song or classical music like that. And that got me interested in exploring art song. Um, and I think if we can convince Lady Gaga to do a, a recital program because Lady Gaga, she's a real singer and artist, a very, really fascinating uh, person in, in popular culture and in musical culture. If we can convince people like that to embrace and bring in and include not only maybe uh, duets and other things with concert artists, but also to maybe take on a few classic art songs themselves, um, then there's a fighting chance. But until we breach that popular divide, which has just grown wider and wider, as you mentioned, um, it's, it's kind of dire. Um, I think there's new thinking that's needed in terms of uh, getting song out there and the people that perform it and sing it so that um, a, water, a wider audience can be awakened to it. Because it, like Margot said, and I said, it really has saved me over and over again through my life. And, uh, and for it to have essentially disappeared from so much of life is, is a tragedy. So I've been on a, a mission to try to reach out to all these people <laughs> to try to get them to, uh, to open up to it because I think that's the only way. It's the performers that have to open the gates for that. I have two thoughts come to mind if I, if I may, yeah. from what you're saying, yeah. which I very, very much agree with you that the uh, attitude and the snobbery has been a great, great disadvantage to the classical music world. And um, in, increasingly so, uh, and yet I feel that I encountered that very much as a young person. I think the snobbery has been around for a very long time. And we just look, need to look historically at where classical music, I, I can only speak about uh, America because Europe is very different, but in America, uh, the classical music was at first thoroughly and thankfully sponsored by uh, the wealthier classes. And you had, that was the world and consequently the people's conception the uh, of, you had to know something, you had to dress a certain way, you had to act as if you knew everything, which I always found particularly offensive, uh, before you could step into a concert hall. Uh, I, I think that still exists. The fear, most of all, exists, or the, uh, the discomfort that many people feel about classical music in general uh, is, is a big, uh, big issue. And I, I would like to go back further uh, at the beginning of the chain that the, for me, the biggest loss in America in the last 30, 40 years, it's now 40 years, is the disappearance of any music in the public schools throughout the entire country. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I'm old enough to have, uh, to have uh, benefited from New York City public schools. And <clears throat> at the very least, we all knew what the Toreador song was and Swan Lake. And we all had to play an instrument. I had a tonette. Uh, shoved down my throat at, at the age of nine, uh, you know, like could, could had to take a, an instrument um, in junior high school. I played the violin. Uh, that was that was the common experience. And we all know that certain political decisions were made in the 80s that it was just judged that the federal government doesn't need to support 
the arts. They don't need it to support arts education. And that should be the choice of the states and the cities. But they let them, they let them loose without an anchor. And so consequently, we now have generations of very smart, educated lawyers, doctors, uh, uh, Wall Street wizards who have absolutely no contact with classical music. And so where I think it all has to start is very, very young. And I think that, that uh, I, I wouldn't count on the schools changing. I wouldn't ch count on politics changing. But I do think that individuals, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, neighbors can take that into their own hands with the little children that they have around them and simply expose them. And it's an amazing amount that what people pick up by osmosis, after all, where does, where does popular music, why is it popular? It, because it's omnipresent and by osmosis, everybody takes it in and they take it in without a sense of an obstacle. There is not something to inhibit there. And, and I think that's where we have to do our work. Bravo, Maestro, bravo. Yes. Bravo, bravo. As performers, we must do something. I couldn't agree more that uh, families um, who have um, love of the arts need to become very visible when I think at a time that they're quite invisible. Um, perhaps politically now in our country, we're going to have a small window uh, and the onus is on us. We need to lead the way um, and say, this hasn't worked, it isn't good enough. We know that we are not a true cultivated people unless the arts lead the way. And so I think we just have to uh, accept the responsibility. I have never in my life and in all of those summer festivals in which I led song programs for many years, um, I have never had a person say, song is boring. I didn't like this. I've had some who questioned whether we wanted to have translations, uh, super titles, uh, all of that kind of uh, issue. Why can't you sing only in English uh, in America? All kinds of issues. Why it is up to us to address that. But I have never had someone say, I don't like this. They wanted more access. They wanted to know how to access. And I think we're at a wonderful time right now when we all admit that music is healing for ourselves and for others. And we see it. We see people gravitating towards it. Um, or at least I do in my community. I have people in my community, it's a retirement complex, calling me, asking me, what will make me feel better? What music do I need to listen to now? What songs can I listen to? Where can I find the texts for those songs? I've decided that I'm going to learn the Venturaise. I want to know that piece of music more than we heard it in a performance in February before we were locked down uh, in our homes without uh, concerts, live concerts. So I just think that we, um, I think one of the silver linings um, that James and I recently spoke about in a telephone conversation, I think one of the great silver linings is that there is time now to address some of these issues, mm -hmm. to write, to write in newspapers, to write essays in our musical journals, to do anything and everything we can to turn this around because politically, Socio-politically, we have a chance now. We have a small window opening, I believe. I absolutely agree that there's a question here of education and it's not just in America. We had generations after the war of free music lessons in schools. Uh, and in the working classes, there were uncovered children of huge talent in many instrumental places that took their places in distinguished British orchestras in the 60s, having grown up and 
the huge effulgence of British musical life was due to the fact that it was supported, there was music in schools, there were classical music concerts for young people. And there was instruments bought by the state. If a young miner's son wanted to learn the clarinet, a clarinet was bought for that child, even if the parent couldn't even begin to hope to afford such an instrument. In the sense of education, I would add also the literature and poetry, particularly in terms of the world we're in, in terms of song. How can you expect to enjoy the poetry of Heine or Miller or Goethe if you haven't actually had any entry into, um, into poetry? And it seems to me that uh, Lieder with all its complexity and its, all its concision is summed up by, say, the poetry of your great Emily Dickinson. Is Emily Dickinson's poetry as much understood and treasured? I'm not talking about musical settings of Emily Dickinson, because although she's a very great poet, she's very difficult to set to music, and Aaron Copeland did so, of course. But what I really, really honestly think is that we've had a lost couple of generations because of sheerly political decisions taken in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. In University Challenge, which is full of the brightest young Oxford and Cambridge people, they are answering questions on every aspect of physics and literature and everything. And then suddenly they have a music question and identify a Haydn symphony as one by Mahler, because Mahler is a, is a name that comes to mind. The, the comparative lack of ignorance in music in comparison to their ability in other spheres is extremely telling. And it's clear that they have not had that osmosis of which James speaks, that osmosis of just having the stuff in the house and not having been fortunate enough to have parents to do it. I just like to say, however, that the idea of trying to sell ourselves better is a very, very, very tricky one. It's got all sorts of problems for me. Yes. You know, in the, in the art world, in the art world, they make millions and millions and millions in a hugely elite exchange of fine. I mean, look at those Sotheby's people. Look at the, the grandeur of the arts. Nobody, they, they, they do try to get people into good exhibitions, but the fact is that money is hugely available in the upper echelons of fine art. Money is also hugely available in the upper echelons of great wine. People drink ordinary wine and like it, but there are always people who prepare to pay whatever it takes to buy Chateau Lafitte. And so, in a sense, many of our problems are surely monetary. It's because nobody is paying or prepared to pay or prepared to come to pay for what we have on offer. And that makes what what we are doing seem even more elite? The answer is right through the arts and through many fields from watchmaking to winemaking to all sorts of other aspects of the art. Elitism manages to exist quite grandly and simply because there's a circulation of money which keeps great paintings and art in circulation. Here we are actually cut off from subsidy of every kind. And I have this vision of people in Lafitte alarmed at how popular the wine boxes have become in the local supermarkets, trying to hide and to market their Lafitte Chateau growth, first growth claret in wine boxes in the hope that it's going to be bought by more people. And that's just how ridiculous it is that something absolutely very special is it's so special that in a sense, how do we both sell it in a friendly way and a, in a less formal way and a less pompous way without throwing the baby out with the bathwater? That's to me the major problem. For example, we could say of the Japanese no drama, you know, it's very good, but it's actually, it's very, very uh, long and it's very slow. And it's uh, those masks, you know, they don't do anything because you can't see people's faces. You can change all that. And then where is the no drama? That is no longer the no drama. So what do we do to make song 
interesting without without the singing, dancing Shona Miller in. Um, but to build on what you're saying, Graham, and, and also what uh, James and Margot were saying, um, what made the difference for us growing up was that it was in school all every day, or access to it, or performers, or a variety of singing in, in community or solo, and doing a musical every year when you were in junior high school or high school. Um, but I've maintained for, for years, one of the things that conservatories and colleges of music should be requiring is that performance majors go into schools and have to work with kids for mm. um, a semester or a year, yeah. you know, as part of their as part of their requirement for graduating mm -hmm. to work with kids, to bring song, to sing with them, to bring great music to them, because mm -hmm. that would fill the void. We have so many performance majors. And I think the answer is right there. We have all these people who yearn to be performers, to be on the stage, to sing song, to perform great music. And, uh, and they're, they are an incredible resource because young kids will respond to them. And that will be, you never know when a light will go off. But I think that needs to move into conservatories and colleges of music so that young people who are studying and mastering this can pass that along to young people. I agree with you, James, it has to start very, very young. Um, it has to become an essential part of their language and identity culturally and so sociologically. Um, so I, I think the answer is there. It just takes someone leading to make it happen and a national movement of it has to happen, hopefully an international movement um, where young people who are learning this in conservatory who are very gifted and who potentially will go on to have wonderful careers or not. Maybe they will go on to be great teachers or they will work you know, elsewhere, but they can bring their passion to those young people and, uh, and they will be able to do it like no one else can because they're educated and qualified. We can't expect elementary school teachers who have no experience in this to suddenly bring this to young people. It needs to come from someone who is passionate about it. As we all know, it is related to passion and something inside of you that needs to connect and share. And uh, that seems to me a solution, um, as well as the great performers that we have now broadening their reach, um, not, not diminishing what, what it is, um, just opening up the doors. Um, and I think this particular thing, the joke deck that you, the, the particular thing that you explained about and yeah. you've mentioned American artists who prepared to do it, it's a very American solution, and yeah. quite rightly, with Songfest as an American institution, and I'm the outsider here. I'm the <laughs> only one who's not in America. The difficulty is um, what happens. I can understand how American singers, particularly stars, particularly those who are well known, who've got big yeah. personalities, who are well known in opera, Jamie Barton, Joyce DiDonato can do these amazing things of opening up. And I mean, neither of those people are short in terms of their recital experience or their recital endeavor. They commission songs, they do songs and they sing songs. But the question is, if a great European artist comes and sings a Schubert leader recital, not in English, uh, and without that element of slight crossover to draw people in, which seems to be an increasing aspect and has been for many years of, um, I mean, crossover is a part even of a composer like John Musto's style. I mean, even a composer like, you know, and you, there's a, there are elements that are drawn from America's popular culture that have become just, just, just like Poulenc uh, took the French cabaret culture as part of his foundation. But it doesn't answer what happens to this body of song literature, whether, you know, Debussy, Ravel, Foy, Poulain, or Schubert, Wolf, Brahms, um, and Schumann. What happens when we are doing this? What, what can be done to make this incredibly intricate and marvelously rewarding music seem less formidable? There's education, there's everything else. But I will say this, and I do think this is true. Um, we have spent our lives cultivating our ears. Our ears are the result of years and years of cultivation. Um, and um, just like art people develop their eyes and uh, perfumiers can smell layers of, 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 of aroma. 
like we hear chords, that's the most amazing thing. There is an element of determination, devotion, setting your cap at it, wanting to do it, becoming enthralled by it, and in a sense, not just having it available at the click of a finger, but inevitably knowing that what you put in is what you're going to get. It's not a very interesting solution from the point of view of finances, from the point of view of putting bottoms on seats immediately, from the point of view of financing Songfest. But it seems to me that great songs can require that type of work. And we shouldn't be ashamed to admit it because it's taken us all our lives to get there ourselves. So that's the point. I don't think there is an instant solution and a solution from childhood on seems to me to be the long term only possible way. You know, as an American, I am much more concerned about the education part of this because our country has since the 60s made such a departure from hunger, admitted hunger for the arts. I remember uh, being shamed as a child because I loved classical music. Mm. Um, and I can't imagine how much worse it might be now. Um, and so I don't see that there's a faster way to do this, but to start with the children the youngest children of today, and to send out all of those college students, all of those uh, people who love the arts. It's happening right now in COVID. I can't tell you how many of the young collaborative uh, pianists in our country are on Zoom teaching essentially music appreciation classes, song appreciation classes. And yes, while most of it is in English, there are uh, wonderful, I heard the most fabulous class uh, last week on Das Feilchen of Mozart. And this pianist was brilliant at giving the class the German text, translating it and almost enacting it with her hands, uh, the story of this precious little opera, two-page song, and the students were mesmerized. It was performed then in English, not a bad translation, uh, effective, and then it was done in German, and the class asked to hear the German when they were offered would you like to hear this again? Yes, they wanted to hear it again. They were invited to react visually themselves, the class, to the text, and they wanted to do it in German. It's, it somehow it, sounded more authentic to them, in a way, perhaps. Absolutely. And they were fast enough to understand um, the text. And so they could nod, you know, with the little flower they could be hopeful and and the class was it was fa fabulous there's nothing missing here except education uh from the youngest ages and so, what's so great what's so great about the song is that it's so cheap in the sense of one singer one instrument it's not yeah. got huge i mean it is slimmed down and it can go on the road I mean, James Connor knows all about the vast expenses of transporting orchestras and everything. And my goodness, huge amounts of money have to be spent in backup. But a song team is about the simplest little performing units that you could possibly have. Yeah. I completely agree. And I would like to jump in, if I may, because I agree with that. Uh, and I, you know, we all, all of us who are involved in symphony orchestras, and opera houses, we know we do not know what we will face after COVID because the, the impact of this is going to be, uh, I think, large and long term. And this is an opportunity, golden opportunity for those of us who believe in song, as we all do here, uh, that we can slip into that 
uh, it won't be a vacuum, but we can slip in now. And part of it is economic. And I was thinking of it earlier while you were speaking, if I may, Graham, if I may say something. Sure. Uh, uh, I was thinking of that earlier with some of the things you're saying. Uh, we, the, two things that need to be addressed in America, at least in any way, is, uh, the, is the languages. Because we grow, up in a, we grow up in a country where there is no longer, to the degree that there was ever uh, foreign language education, it's de greatly diminished. And this is part of our so this is part of our problem in the world, frankly, is that uh, Americans only speaking American, and I'll, I say that advisedly, only speaking American have no contact with the rest of the world and don't even realize that other people don't speak English or American and don't even care to, to even make a small effort to learn Spanish, French, German, Russian, Italian, uh, or any of the, the, uh, the Eastern languages. This is a big problem for us. And it's one of the reasons that we are uh, constantly having real trouble uh, relating to the rest of the world. So what does this have to do with song? I think that we have to find a way to interest people who are not just in language, but to make them as Margot, as you just pointed out with this wonderful example, where you can say, okay, listen, this sounds different. This is Italian, or this sounds different. It's German. Now you won't understand all of it, but listen to, let's listen to some of it. Let's see what's there. And then the moving right uh, into uh, the second area that uh, we are so addicted to excitement in America, that people can't sit still and listen to an art form that makes them sit still, makes them quieter, and, and requires them to listen to something intimate. And what is the song literature but that? It is intimate. Mm -hmm. uh, is it exciting? Well, not in the way that Americans generally understand excitement. And I think we're, we, as a, as a culture, are so addicted to that that we have lost our ability to sit still. And with all of the, uh, I would say million dollar industry in every form of meditation, uh, what's, you know, app, apps for meditation, saying everybody app, meditate. Listening, listening, to this, listening to this kind of music is meditative and can serve the same purpose to people as meditation. And yet there's a, you know, and rightfully, there's a, there's a there's a market for meditation. We have to find a way to make people realize that this kind of intimate music, chamber music, uh, string quartets, leader recitals are intimate, and they slow you down purposefully. Bravo! Yeah. Yeah. Being quiet. But yeah. that's, it's what the Germans, the Germans call that Innigkeit and that, that, that element of an internal world. And I would say that knowing many American students, and I'm no rival to Margot's knowledge, but haven't you noticed, Margot, that as they get in touch with Baudelaire through Debussy or Goethe through Schubert, that the song world is gifting some of these pianists and singers an entire library of European responses that it turns them into world citizens. I mean, in a way that studying a chamber music piece, which is just only notes and no language, doesn't quite do. You know, a very wonderful uh, memory of in my early life was playing for Dawn Upshaw outside of this country. Um, and she was genius at getting the Europeans to love her English language song, a lot of Emily Dickinson, a lot of theater. And the way she described it to the audience drew the audience to her and to her language. And we can do the same. I've seen Jamie Barton do it. Um, I've seen a lot of singers do it. I believe that we sell our audiences short when we assume we can't meet them. I believe that, again, it is up to us to learn how to meet them.
I don't think it's going to come from printed text or a super title. It's going to come from our own enthusiastic, um, educated, yes, but then natural passion for our text. And I believe that people understand one another more by their music with text. So it, it, is, it is song that can lead the way in this, because as Graham says, it's not going to, it's not moving a symphony orchestra across the world. It's a pianist and a singer. You know, there's not a single pianist or singer who is involved in the song repertoire here in Britain who sings French by their second nature. The French are our neighbors, the Germans are our Teutonic cousins who voted for Brexit. The whole idea of wanting to separate this country from yeah. Europe is a Philistine thing that happened as a result of nobody having their handle on this consanguinity of great text and emotion mm -hmm. that we share with Europe. And it, in that sense, the study of song in various languages is an international challenge of international friendship and significance. Because once you've studied a great poet in another language and really done some work on it, you feel differently about that language, that people, that country. It's very, very broadening. I think what you're all talking about too is uh, everyone in who loves this and is passionate about it has to be an ambassador for it. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, and this is what I was talking about with, you know, students who have discovered that passion, bringing that passion as ambassadors of this art form to young people. Um, you know, young people's concerts are, <laughs> they're rare anymore, but, you know, they can be enlightening, but it's that consistent exposure to someone who is passionate about it that can wake someone up in a way that, uh, that other, thing, other things cannot. And it's that one-to-one -one communication, being in the room and experiencing someone sing like that. I don't know if you remember the first time you were actually in the room when a great singer, singer opened their mouth and out came the sound. And maybe you didn't understand the words, but you understood what was behind those words. Um, and so I think everyone getting, you know, and James, you and I talked about this too, this sort of ancient snobbish attitude. We have to get past that and everyone can't live in an ivory tower and performers no matter what level of career you are, you have to be an ambassador for this. You have to be an ambassador to bringing more people into the fold, to bringing people to concerts. You know, I know a lot of performers who say, well, I never go to concerts, you know, I, I'm too busy doing this or that. You have to go to concerts and you have to bring people to them. Right. You have to talk to them about it. People that have never gone, people with money, people who could become donors, people who could welcome people into the fold. I think everyone has to get off a high horse and be an ambassador to this. Um, my role model on this is um, Flicka von Stada, Frederica von Stada, who now works with uh, inner city kids, has for years now uh, a group called the Young Musicians Choral Orchestra for really disadvantaged kids from very dire circumstances who have talent and then wind up getting placed in conservatories and universities around the country. Um, by pursuing music, music becomes a way out of a dire situation for them because someone shows up and cares. Someone with passion opens their ears and their eyes to another world of possibility. Mm. And I think that's where, where we all have to go. And now with social media, you know, dominating everything and people so visually uh, and, you know, everything has to be visually stimulating, like you were saying, James and, and, and Graham. Um, to find a way to bring people into a place of reflection that is based on art song, on great poetry, on great music, on really listening and paying attention. It takes someone who shows up for you. And that person has to have the passion and the information to wake, to wake you up. And, um, and I think that's what's been missing, like James said, for the past 40 years, and certainly in this country. Um, but we have a responsibility as people who care about it to show up. And uh, it is all about showing up. Do you remember those wonderful community concerts? Sorry, James. Oh, no, go ahead. In the community concerts, which I got to know in my early years of playing in, in America, it always struck me that just like I was a young boy who grew up in colonial Africa and sat in the back and heard music that awoke something in my soul at the age of six or seven, that there is somebody in any of those small towns 
to whom your presence at that seemingly small or unprestigious concert is going to make a life-changing difference. Because not everybody is receptive. This that we're discussing is going to go, we have to accept it's going to go by many people who will not respond. But there are inborn, there is an inborn longing very often awaiting to be awoken in certain souls and certain talents and certain people due to their innate gifts that are sleeping. The chance to just reach a person who hears something magically beautiful for the first time that they have not heard at home. This can be life changing. And that's the reason why we should all go and do concerts in small towns whenever we can, because we never know who we're going to reach. Yeah. I wanted to add, to add uh, one element that I've that I have brought into my own practice, uh, and, th and this is all thanks to the the uh, to Los Angeles Opera, where I had an opportunity to do it, uh, and that is to actually help people find context uh, when they come to a performance. Now, you actually, as well, those are, you know, as a as a pianist, as a singer it's now common practice to talk to the audience about the song they're about to sing. This is not common practice uh, in an opera house for various reasons. Uh, but we have the facility to do that in Los Angeles. And over the last 15 years, I have given a introductory talk at almost every performance I have given over that period of time. And the audience has grown to the point where by the end of that 45 minute talk, we have the foyer half the audience is in that foyer. And I think, what do I get out of that? Well, first of all, I get a great personal satisfaction out of that, but it, it has proven to me that people really do want context. They are happy to, uh, to, to listen and learn something, whatever it is about. I, I talk, I don't tell stories, backstage stories about prima donnas and conductors and well, I talk about the work. It is all centered on the work and it's all centered on either the history of the work, the history of the, of the composer, the context, uh, the context of uh, you, the development of from of Italian opera, let's say from Bel Canto to, to, to Verdi and to Puccini, or to talk about Wagner uh, and, you know, his, his roots with a uh, German spiel opera and the Grand Opera of, of, of Paris. It's, it doesn't matter what you talk about if you expand them and they're very happy to hear it. And I think that somehow we have to find a way to, to make that a regular part of presentation. Would I prefer that everybody walk into the theater, listen to something or come to a concert and listen to it and that would be enough? Yes, and that's the way it was once upon a time. But at least in America, I think we have to expand that experience uh, so that it includes it includes their intellects in a way that they're ready to do, but they don't know that there is all of that. And just as you said, uh, you know, a uh, uh, Graham, that, that, that reading Goethe or reading any of, the, any of the poetry that you are required to know to play leader or to sing it does open you up to that culture. And I think that people in America, and I'm speaking about America, can be opened to culture in general and going through that door who knows maybe they will study german who knows uh anything to make them and any but anything that is mind expanding i would say yeah music has an extraordinary way when combined with words of awaking emotions and if you actually i think that the greatest export that germany has ever given the world is not mercedes benz or bosch or even boss it's actually the lead, because it is the lead that actually has stolen into the hearts of people that were still performing Schubert when the Nazis were bombing from above. Myra Hess was still having Schubert leader in the National Gallery. That Schubert survived in the British love consciousness, even during the war. And there is a feeling of understanding and loving a language because it's combined with notes and harmonies and things that are so compelling that the curiosity is awoken. And I'm absolutely certain that even if it's the beautiful aria in Italian or an exquisite uh, line from Istua Naturelle of Ravel, 
that these languages are going to appear more delectable and more interesting to study if they are heard in combination with music. I'll just tell you a little story that Richard Stokes, who was teacher at uh, Westminster School, a very, very grand school in London, always started his German and teaching his 12 year old, 13 year olds when they came in for their first German lesson with Fischer Dieskars Erlkönig. And a boy who'd never heard any leader, never heard any Schubert, sat at the back completely enraptured. And that boy was Ian Bostridge. And without that way of teaching the German language in a school, he would never have even thought of becoming a musician. So that's, it's just, uh, we also have to say that very fortunately, Mr. Bostridge's father was of the uh, wealthy ability to pay for that type of schooling. And I think that's where the tragedy is of uh, so much that many, many people are not going to get these connections because of sheer class and finance. And, uh, you know, except if people make exceptional exceptions like Dawn, James, what you said about what, uh, what, what Jake said about Dawn is absolutely amazing. And, and I think we, that's where the effort should be. Trying to reach people from less stable and less um, glorious financial backgrounds. Well, you know, I was in Italy in the 60s every summer for about two months uh, through the, I would say, 64 through 70 something or other. And during the horrendous um, riots, the racial issues, in our country, as an American, uh, they're playing for African American singers uh, in that summer, those summers in Italy around Florence and Siena. It was not the Italian music that the Italians wanted to hear, it was the American spiritual. And we changed our programs to become relevant to the Italian, not by singing their music and playing their music, but by bringing the current issues from our country through the African-American spiritual. Now, I have many friends still in um, Tuscany and go often to Italy and when I give classes at the Accademia Chigiana guess what they're singing there still American spiritual white spirituals black spirituals but they're an important part of their song repertory because mm -hmm. at a time in which it was so pathos filled, nothing but that repertory, deep river, um, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, um, precious Lord, those things are still sung by these generations now of performers and teachers. Um, so imagine what we can do in the world if we take our beloved melody and lead with us and try to develop a sense of being relevant at all times and all ways. Um, the war songs of Poulenc um, are perfect for this time. And it doesn't take very much to introduce them to an audience who's hungry and is being quieted. I love that everybody's talking about getting quiet because that's what the song can do for us. It can make us quiet to receive in a way in which our instinct is to, you know, multitask 
Um, and as we listen and as we do, you know, we turn on music while we're cooking, we turn on music while we're driving. Um, I, you know, my husband used to shave and listen to music on his way to work in the car, driving the car. Triple, you know, that's who we are. <laughs> so I just love that. Um, I think we have to have patience and I hope and believe that the professional issues will one day, I may not live to see it, will resolve themselves if in fact we could develop a culture of education in song, in the arts, um, all languages, but to be relevant is the, is the, the big deal. To allow surely great poets, great minds, great thinkers, great musicians to be our guides yes. through a terrain of human experience and emotion because they've experienced it all. They've experienced the wars, they've experienced the horrors, the unfairnesses, the tragedies, the bereavements, everything that's part of the human condition is mirrored in song. Song illustrates life in a very specific way, poem by poem and event by event. And that's what's precious about it. And no one is immune to that. Yeah. As I said, I've never met someone who didn't get stopped in their tracks when in the face of a great song and even pretty good pianist and singer. <laughs> Which is why I say, you know, especially since this is for Songfest and 25 years of Songfest, which is miraculous. Congratulations, Rosemary. Um, is we all have to be ambassadors. We have to think of ourselves as those ambassadors that take music out to the, to the community. Mm -hmm. That's why we devote ourselves to it so that we can connect with other people in this very special way that has been so meaningful to us uh, and transformed our lives. And we can maybe reach someone else. Um, your Ian Bostridge story is so touching. I remember when I was at, uh, my first year of college, I moved to Paris. I needed to get out of America and the suburbs. And I went to the American College in Paris and I hadn't really studied. Uh, I'd studied piano, but I didn't know much about song. I knew about popular song and uh, musicals. I thought I was gonna write musicals at that point. And I, was in a, I decided to take a music appreciation class and the teacher put on the presentation of the Rose from Rose and Cavalier. And I just exploded in tears and I felt like the axis of my life had shifted. And suddenly all I wanted to go to was vocal programs in, when I was in Paris or all over Europe and when I came back. And it was just that one moment. And you never know when someone's life or access is going to be shifted by something like that. And so for everyone involved in Songfest um, who comes here to, to learn and to study, remember that you are an ambassador and you're never too young to be a mentor to someone else. Just the way we all look for our mentors and our guides, whether they are teachers or performers that we admire or poets long gone or composers long gone that we admire and connect with. Um, you, you can be a mentor and someone who transforms someone's life who's much younger than you and who needs you. Um, and uh, I can't stress that enough. I think it's uh, so important. We get very lost in our studies, in our heads because it requires all of you. Um, but it's also very important to remember that it is a vibration that needs to be shared. Um, and until you let it go, it's, uh, it, it doesn't really have that much meaning. It mean, may mean something to you, but it doesn't resonate and have its true meaning until you let that vibration spread to other people. I like hearing you say you're never too young to be an ambassador. And I'd like to add to that, you're never too old either. <laughs> For those of us that are over 39 years old, uh, it's very easy to have been put on the shelf uh, uh, with the with the concurrent, along with excitement, is the a, a culture of youth and celebrity. It's very important that we we also uh, keep giving everything we know, even if people are saying, "Is it relevant?" Well, the answer is, of course, yes, it is relevant, and uh, if when that question comes up, well, why is, is classical music relevant? And I say, look, a Beethoven sonata doesn't have to prove its relevance to me. Uh, if I don't get it, then it's me who needs to make the effort 
to understand. Now that doesn't go over very well in our culture, but we have to, we have to take that by stealth. Uh, we have to get around that and and make sure that whatever it is that we have knowledge that we have accumulated and the passion that we that has led us uh, to accumulate it uh, is not put under a bushel uh, at at a certain point in life. Uh, I think we we the older than thirty nine. <laughs> can I can I echo what Jake said about Rosemary and and everything in Songfest that she's accomplished and the amazing thing that it's twenty five years old. And I was reading as an outsider, um, the seventeen eighty eight Constitution of the United States because I think reading that is actually very interesting for all people interested in the political situation at the moment. And I found the lines that said, no person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of 25 years. And I think that Songfest has earned the right to be representative <laughs> of a great deal of what is best in American music. And it takes its place proud, proudly next to the other very distinguished programs that Margot has directed. You know those famous names, but I think it's Rosemary's achievement after 25 years that we've stepped up to having Songfest as a really significant player in the world of um, summer song festivals. You're here. If, You're here. here. Absolutely. Here. If I may also say, um, because I have spent a lot of time at um, all, I guess I can really say all the American song programs, um, the summer festivals. There's something so precious for me about Songfest that no other festival has. And it must be in the air um, in California. And it certainly is in the spirit and the genius, maybe she doesn't even know, with which Rosemary has devoted her life um, to this amazing thing that is Songfest. But it's unique in the sense that I have never seen a program that has very, very young singers, all the way up through young professional singers, who support one another in incredible ways. Young singers are freer to be young and to be uh, unknowing. They feel free to experiment. They are encouraged by their older colleagues. The older colleagues are informative for the younger singer as they observe them on the stage. They see their nerves behind the stage in their working every day. So the, the tremendous um, growth that happens in the summer for every person i've not ever seen it not happen that a young singer grows tremendously in the summer it comes not only from the faculty um but it comes from the fact that there's such a big range of ages and uh, expertise among the singers that are there and the pianist it's true for the pianist too yeah. Uh, although most pianists see themselves as um, additions, you know, to the group of singers that they're working with, however uh, experienced and excellent um, or young and naive they are, the pianists mold themselves around the need of the moment. But it's absolutely unique. I've never seen anything like it, no other program. Um, invites people at all different stages of development. So happy anniversary to... Yes. <laughs> happy 25, <laughs> Rosemary and Songfest. Well, <clears throat> thank you all very much. Um, this has been a treat and such a wonderful session uh, for all of us. Um, I just want to wish you all the best moving forward and uh, Please stay safe and healthy. And I hope we can return to making music in person very soon and see each other again.
After thank all. you, Xavier. Thank you. Thank you Thank you for having us. Good to see you all. Thank you. Be well, be safe. Wow. Well, thank you very much. You, you you didn't interrupt with all your other questions. You were no, I mean, you, you were asking, <laughs> answering all my possible questions. So there was no need for me to ask anything. I mean, you touched upon every single one of them and more. But the one thing, the one thing that I was longing for you to ask is the difference between uh, uh, the, the opera singers and the different challenging of song and opera. Because I would dare to say, and I'd only dare to say it in the face of a conductor I admire so tremendously, and I've heard so often on disc and in concert with James, people that I've performed with, like Margaret Price and other great singers have embraced the song recital, particularly as they have done late in life, uh, later in life, because they don't have to deal with the conductor. Oh, I don't blame <laughs> <laughs> And the interesting thing is that most people don't say that that is the major difference that a recitalist has, that they do not have somebody regulating things like tempi and flow, and they have to develop their inner conductor and that the actual accompanist or the collaborative pianist has to actually acquire certain of the skills of a conductor, but by different means of osmosis and nothing that's the same, nothing that's even remotely the same because it can't be that pianist's decision. But it's an amazing thing about how some singers learn how they want to shape things and other singers never ever learn how to shape and remain hopeless recitalists because they remain dependent on the conductor for that very special thing. Does that make any sense to you about what I'm trying to say? Well, well, well of course, and I understand how she felt. Uh, and at the same time, I just, just like to suggest to you that uh, if you are a conductor who has a deep commitment to song the human voice and of course mm. if and that would include opera but not exclude the others you you do what you're describing the pianist does yes you assume the uh identity of the singing and the singer mm -hmm. as well as you assume the identity of the text and you should uh, be able to facilitate that uh while not seeming to. And I think that uh, for me, I'm very sensitive watching uh, colleagues, uh, some of whom I know, some whom I don't know, very sensitive to noticing who has made that jump and who has not amongst conductors. That uh, it is actually possible to do both. Mm -hmm. It is not all about directing and being directive, it is a far more subtle, yeah, uh, subtle course. interchange between an orchestra, a chorus, a solo singer, and so some of us actually do a little bit of, of what. Of course, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, of course, that's absolutely true. And let's face it, it's just because if you've sung a role, say, in Britain's Albert Herring forty times, as happened once at Dimeborn, and a new young Russian demigod came in, who had never known or seen the work before and proceeded to give tempos which were absolutely different from the ones that the people had been doing for the last 40 years and without particular reason, simply because frankly he didn't know the work as well as he might. It's one of those things that I think uh, a great accompanying conductor um, and you number among those is very, very different from someone who simply regards singers as bits and pieces of machinery in their own conception. I've adopted your right. And you will admit there are such conductors around. Yeah, I, I, I'm not here to defend all of my colleagues. <laughs> no. And I think also that we have to, uh, I think all of us need to re, uh, re examine the word accompany and, 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 to, and to figure out its etymology and to realize it is not a secondary role and that it is uh, because it, it carries in certain people's mind uh, and implicit, if not an explicit, suggestion of a 
somebody in the background. It is not, I mean, I don't have to tell you, either of you. I don't, I don't, Sorry. I'm one of the few people who don't mind using it. I'm an unashamed accompanist, which is the name of my teacher, Gerald Moore. He called himself an unashamed right. accompanist. And I, and, I, he, and I loved him. I mean, he was a hero from the time I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, the, but, to, but to, to rehabilitate, not the word, but to rehabilitate people's understanding of that word and how they view it. But that's an American thing. I mean, most of us in in um, in the Americas, um, I dare say, tell me if I'm wrong, Graham. It appears to me that uh, England, primarily, maybe uh, also uh, the rest of Europe. I don't really know. Um, thinks that we don't like the word accompanying and that um, we think collaborative pianist is a more appropriate term. That term came from the Juilliard School. It was never intended to be used in the profession. It was about the computer. When the computer came to Juilliard in the late 80s, um, by the time, uh, sorry, early 80s, by the time the collaborative piano department was born in 1984, soon thereafter they had to have wording for the computer of the time that they required um, an uh, adjective before the word piano. It couldn't be piano-solo, piano dash accompanying because the computer didn't work that way wow. it had to wow. come before the word piano and dear sam sanders wow. worked for six months to come up with the right term and he couldn't find it he called me literally with this was not unusual three o'clock in the morning one day <laughs> marco i got it do you remember that big big oxford dictionary in my studio um, and I said, well, sure. And he said, you know, I just started going through things and I found the word collaborator. So collaborative pianist, that's it. That's it. And I thought, well, that was the best thing I'd heard. Some of the ideas he'd come up with were disasters before that. He said, you know, way down at the bottom, archaic and poetic definition of collaborator was one who fraternizes with the enemy. <laughs> and he well, loved I've, always, I've always thought a collaborative pianist played the piano on the Champs-Élysées for German generals circa exactly. 1940 <laughs> to 1944. Well, that was right. <laughs> but Sam loved to think of himself as working with the enemy because nobody ever loved his partners more than he did. <laughs> you know, he had this wicked sense of humor. But even the Germans have a problem with their word for accompanist, which is begleiter, which also means escort. Right. So, uh, I mean, right. and actually paid escort and all those other intimations of what escort can be. And yeah. uh, I had, I didn't even get the jokes at first as the begleiterin uh, on the programs, you know, in Germany. But, but, yeah. but really, it was never intended to be. I mean, we were the most surprised of all at Juilliard when the world began using the words collaborative pianist. That's because a great story, Margo. I would never, have, never have known that. Uh, no, I, no, it was a great story, Margo. That, that is, that, that's, that's one for the books. Thank you. Well, that's the way it was. You know, I, I, you've got to go. My wife, whom some of you know, I, I have used to always get couldn't get over the fact that I would receive invitations well mostly uh, due to my job in Cologne uh, Herr Kotlin und Begleitung I mean, you're not even you don't even you have a you have a neuter it has a kind of neuter but, uh, General. So, and speaking of Begleitung, it is my anniversary, and I think I better say good morning to her. <laughs> so, I'm going to go off and and do that.